The BDNF increases creative expression. BDNF is brain-derived nootropic factor. We all hear a million times that the only thing that matters is right now, the now moment, the yeah. zero point. When you're creative, you're in the zero point. Yeah. Every okay. nootropic is enhancing BDNF. Fasting is huge for BDNF. If the key is enhancing creative flow or creative expression, then what do we do in combination to enhance that so that we can live in that state, the zero point at all times in our life. Yeah. Fasting, BDNF enhancing agents, red light, cold plunging. Exercise, sleep. Exercise, yeah. deep restorative sleep. Yeah, I mean, there's there's no oh. question that we can use all these new tools and tactics to live in the now point. Oh man. You watch the movie Limitless where the guy takes a pill and gets super smart. Today's episode, we talk about peptides that actually do that, how to use them, where to get them. Great episode. By the way, if you want to see if peptides are right for you, go work with a doctor. Go see the experts at mphormones.com. Work with a doctor, get some labs done, and get peptides made in a pharmacy. See about maximizing your progress, fat burning, muscle building, longevity, but do it again. Do it with a doctor. We've already worked with them. They're great. mphormones.com. Go check it out. Anyway, here's today's giveaway. We're going to give away the MAPS Super Bundle. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. We're also running a sale right now. MAPS Cardio, half off. The Shredded Summer Bundle of Programs, half off. And the Bikini Bundle of Programs is also half off. If you're interested, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. All right, Jay, we had so much fun with you on the last podcast. We had to do another one. So, <laughs> we got to follow it back. We talked awesome. about peptides and longevity, and uh, that was kind of supposed to be the focus. We went off in some rabbit holes, but it was a lot of fun. I wanted to talk to you about um, peptides for cognitive performance, brain function. Um, there's a few of these that I started using myself. I noticed some pretty profound effects. Um, so let's get into that whole space and kind of what – how peptides can target cognitive performance or what that whole category of nootropics would even mean. Yeah, for sure. And again, thank you guys for the first episode. It was amazing. Grateful to be back here again today to talk. Um, so it's interesting. I think peptides, you know, if you really start looking at them from like a clinical perspective, you know, people are pretty well aware now of the healing capacity of peptides, the fat loss and the muscle gain capacity. Um, you know, I know on our first podcast, we also talked about the life extension. And of course now, um, in the in the age of the bioweapon, you know, immunity enhancement too. But for nootropics, there's a lot of peptides. Uh, and I know you guys, you know, are old school and that you go back to like the race of TAMs and, you know, all the stuff that was right. out there originally sure. before peptides, yeah. you know, talking about cognitive enhancement. Um, and so there was a lot of stuff out there. And as I told you guys on the last podcast, you know, I kind of, for my qualitative and comparative, uh, you know, line in the sand, it's modafinil, like what does something produce relative to like what does modafinil at 50 to hundred milligrams produce? And so in my personal experience, I really haven't had the profound uh, effects that a lot of my friends, some of you guys, of course, you know, also mentioned on the first podcast. I know you saw, so you talked about dihexa that others get. Um, so I think we're all biochemically unique, but to talk about nootropics, um, you know, from a peptide standpoint, you know, we probably should start with dihexa. Uh, the interesting thing is, and we didn't really talk about this on the first show, and we probably should mention it, is most peptides from a highest impact delivery system are injected, right? They're subcutaneously injected. You know, people hear needles, oh my God, opt out, right? But like, the truth is, is like you're using, you know, they're mostly aqueous based, they're water based. So you're using like an insulin syringe, you know, which a lot of people unfortunately are familiar with diabetics and they're using insulin syringes to inject their insulin. But these are small, you know, uh, micro microscopic, you know, uh, hypodermic 31, 32, 30 gauge needles. They're like, you know, five sixteenth of an inch. So yeah, you don't even feel them. Yeah, you don't feel, them, right? So it's like, I always tell people, they're like, bro, I can't, I can't inject. I can't do it. I'm like, bro, you inject one time, it becomes like brushing your teeth. So it's not a big deal. But, you know, to say that, to qual qualitatively say that, the, the, the nootropic peptides are the one space, you know, in the peptide industry where there are a lot of orals. Okay. And there's also intranasal, right? So some of them can be, uh, you know, technically snorted or again, intranasal, like through an intranasal inhaler or mister. Like C-Max. Yeah, exactly. So um, I think, you know, we it, it's important that we bring that up, right? Because a lot of people, I'm telling you, as much as we laugh and say, come on, dude, it's just it's a, a pin trick. It's a barrier of entry. Yeah, yeah it it's absolutely totally is. It is. So, you know, it's cool that, to know that you can use these and not ever really have to inject yourself. Although I will say, um, the most pronounced effects from nootropics are still felt injected, 
Okay. okay you know, like C, C- Max, uh, Slank, uh, even Dihexa from the, you know, if you, if you go on the Reddit forums, which we know are not the best places to get information, but if you go there and you go deep and you drill down, you know, you'll see some of the really advanced users will talk about the difference between uh, intranasal, uh, oral, or injected, and everybody talks that the injected version. So those all best. actually co- are injectable too. So yes. I could have got CMAX that way. Absolutely. Oh, okay, I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, I mean, and remember too, you know, from a bio- biochemical or, you know, a molecular dynamic standpoint, you know, obviously impact, injection is always going to be the highest impact because how it's fast direct. it crosses the brain brain. Yeah, brain it's just brain right brain. there. Exactly. Yeah, you know, you, you mentioned <laughs> the individuality with a lot of these things. Mm-hmm. You mentioned racetems. Now those are not peptides. No. But I do want to bring them up because per Paracetam, I believe, was probably the first classic nootropic. It's been around for a long time. For sure. And I remember when I first discovered paracetam, and I don't like it much. Um, I do notice some effects, but I get this crash, and I don't like totally. it. Totally. But I, I did notice some effects, and I remember introducing it to the guys here. And Justin got a little bit of effect. Yeah. Doug and Adam both got headaches. Yeah, right. They hated it. So it, it, there definitely is, and I noticed that with other classic nootropics, and other, that some people get great re- results with some of them. Other people get terrible results with some of them. So it's one of those things where some are probably going to work for you and others may not. Doug, Doug and Adam are just like me again. Yeah. <laughs> I got the headache. Yeah. Dude, race stamps are garbage. I remember literally, uh, okay, so another, another true story. Uh, I'm going back, I'm dating myself. So I used to meet Dan Duchesne. Oh, God, uh, it's the guru. <laughs> across the border in Mexico. He mentored me for literally three years. You're kidding me. No. Wow. No. This is the guy that, so cool. this is the guy that really, uh, if you look at the bodybuilding protocols on fat loss, muscle building. Body opus. Everything. I mean, he's the guy that, he's the first, by the way, he created, he was one of the, the, the contributors to the first actual real pre-workout I've talked about That's before. That's absolutely Ultimate true. Orange. Is, uh, yeah, Ultimate Orange. Yeah. yeah. I still actually have a bottle of Ultimate Orange. I kept it. So no way. It's funny. I swear no to God. The real I, shit? I swear to God. Yeah. I mean, it's not edible, but it's no. I have the whole thing. <laughs> but yeah. And, uh, you know, it's funny that you said that because he also had that little pamphlet. So he, he, you know, he was around in the times of the pamphlets, you, the, the, you know, they had the little tiny things that you could buy in the back of the muscle magazine. Yep. He had ultimate training. And, and I still have, of course, I have his book, the, you know, the greatest book probably ever in bodybuilding, which was called body opus underground body opus, which taught you how yeah. to back load carbs and front load carbs. He and talked about stuff now that everybody's like, all this, those yeah. things. Yeah. 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 So he was a genius. And, and a true story, um, Dan had a huge heart. Uh, the, so, so I got to tell you guys a story. So how I actually got to mentor under him is he, on one of the underground forums, he put a p- picture of a bodybuilder um, who was shredded, you know, from uh, that he eventually is, the, it's the guy that was on the cover of Body Opus. Yeah. And he asked if anybody could name this guy, um, you know, I would give you a, a prize or an award or whatever. And I instantly like wrote about, you know, I was just in the group that was like re- reading his writings and it was Hans Hobstocken. Oh. And how I knew who that guy was is that he was the owner of Foothill Gym in Monrovia, California, where I was training at. Oh, so uh, <laughs> how crazy is that? So anyway, after that, him and I became friends, again, internet friends. And then I finally met him. And this is the truth at, re- at the, the, um, oh man, um, not the rock, what's it called? Um, hard rock restaurant in Tijuana. Oh, because <laughs> Dan places. was living in Mexico. Yep. So I would literally cross the border in San Diego and we would sit there. I would you know, take a cab to Revolution and I would sit there and I would talk to him and him and I would just go deep for three or four hours. And he educated me. I was only 27 years old. Yeah, a lot of people need to realize that these uh, underground bodybuilding coaches or whatever, they were the smartest the, people. They were ever. the pioneers. Uh, you know, I, I remember he wrote yes. about or talked about something called DNP, which yes, is very of dangerous, course. DNP. fat burning compound, very dangerous. I think it's a, co- a chemical use in making dynamite. Yes. Um, but he, I mean, just brilliant person um, and unhinged, which I- Completely you, you, unhinged. Which you kind of want when you're when you're the right. first person to talk right. about these kinds of things. Right. So right. I want to give, you know, just kind of credit where it's due. Yeah, no, absolutely. And Dan was amazing. And he taught me so much about everything that I learned and, and knew, but it's just, it's hilarious. But, uh, you know, to get back to nootropics, uh, the, that's where he, he was the one that taught me about Perestam. And he mm. literally took me into a pharmacia you know, right there, we just buy it right over the counter. I, no lie, I found a picture, a Polaroid picture the other day of me and him. My mom, my mom sent it to me because you know they they've got still stuff in their basement, and uh, it was uh, of I was holding a box in the picture of the Perestan uh-huh. and the orange. I can't remember it was the original European, uh, you know, pharmaceutical manufacturer that had it. But that's so funny. But yeah, so none of those things. Um, that was a good rabbit hole. Yeah. <laughs> no, none, none of those things. 
uh, did anything for me either, bro. Right. Headache, yeah. horrible, literally yeah. horrible. But they, like you said, they're very crude, very rudimentary form of a nootropic. And now here we are today, you know, fast forward 20 plus years and you have these amazing um, nootropic peptides. But getting back to uh, intranasal, oral or injectable, injectable is always again going to be the highest impact. But to talk a little bit about dihexa, as I told you guys, I've taken a heroic dose of dihexa many times, which is 80 milligrams, okay. like 40 is like the highest recommended dose of an oral capsule. Yeah. You were taking 30, correct? 30, I think, I think I'm doing 30 a day or 20. Yeah, and you feel it, right? And yeah. I don't feel anything. You said you don't feel anything. Did you feel it? Have you oh, used yeah, it? I felt it. Okay, yeah. so you guys felt it. But what were like what were the effects? So it took, it, it was almost cumulative, but after, at the end of the week, um, I'm just sharper. Yeah. Memory recall. Memory recall was recall. big for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, just I just feel like I need less sleep. And I don't, yeah. it's not because I'm sleeping less. But, well, I am sleeping less. I have, a, I have an infinite home. Yeah. But all of a sudden I was, I felt like I was sharp, like if I got a good night of rest. Yeah. So not that it replaced sleep. I could still tell I was tired. But um, I remember I'd come in here and I'd tell the guys, I'd be like, I feel remarkable. I would just, the, my exact words were, I feel remarkably sharp for how little sleep I'm getting right now because we have a baby at home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's what I noticed from that. But I'm also combining that with the C-Max. So were you we, taking so, it? Were you taking it every day? Yeah. Yeah. Just right, right when you woke up, right first mm -hmm. thing in the morning. Uh, yeah. First Were thing you in the morning. Were you combining it with uh, coffee or caffeine or anything? Yes, I do. I yeah. do. I, I typically would do caffeine because then I'll work out. Yeah, I would be interested to notice. Did you guys? Did you ever take it without caffeine, Justin? No, I yeah. do on the weekends. I go off caffeine on yeah. the weekends. Right? So I, it would be interesting, and I don't know if anyone's ever done any correlationals to this, but it would be interesting to see like the difference of feeling it versus not being on caffeine versus being mm. on caffeine. And I've heard stories from some people again, just anecdotally. Um, that there's a synergistic effect. Yeah, I would I would assume so, right? Because I've heard people call dihexa say that dihexa was like BDNF, right? Yeah. Or several times, it or many thousands of times yeah. more powerful, have a yeah. similar effect, right? And yeah. that, that what does that do? That improves neuroplasticity and learning. In the yeah. Brain. So 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 yeah. So I mean, and we'll talk about tesofensine and how it expands BDNF. But BDNF is brain derived neurotropic factor. And to go back to like a historical standpoint, like when when the ancients would talk about going into the wilderness to meditate or to pray, you know, 20 days, 30 days, 40 days or whatever, they were literally going to fast, which it massively enhanced BDNF. Yeah. And the BDNF connection is the quote unquote connection to source or connection to spirit, you know, connection to divinity, whatever you want to call it. Because because that's what you feel like, right? You, you're a faster, a ketogenic dieter. Right. I mean, when you get through that crossover where the brain starts running on yep. ketones for fuel, you all of a sudden feel, whoa. And as a you know, hardcore faster like myself, I fasted, um, the longest I've ever fasted without actual food is 76 hours, right? Because like I, you know, I've written a couple books on fasting and, you know, I was familiar with like Jason Fung's research on fasting and it shows like the best, the, the best research on the, on the, in the world. And I know peer reviews nonsense, but you know, if I want to say the science, trust the science, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the, uh, the, the best research there's, there's, there are studies done in like Olympic caliber, um, sprinters and without food, uh, what was it before they started to break down muscle tissue? And it was 73 hours. Yeah, it was about three days. It was 73 yeah. hours, right? So it's like when you hear bros say, oh man, I got to eat six times a day, bro. I can't go that long. I'm going to break down muscle. They don't really understand the science or the or, No, you or just get carb depleted and flat. That's exactly. Is, yeah. Exactly. But you don't lose muscle, right? Yeah. So it's like if you really learn how to fast and you go, you know, like I was telling you guys, that program I got coming called 30 Days. Uh, to shreds. Um, if you really understand the metabolics or, or, or the mechanics, the biomechanics of fasting combined with all these drugs like peptides that we're talking about and all these new metabolic uncouplers that are coming, you can truly get insanely ripped without losing muscle, right? Mm. In a very short amount of time. But to not rabbit hole and to, you know, to go back to understanding like what these are doing, I mean, you really truthfully do increase BDNF at about 30 hours and at that 30 hours without food, there's like something that goes on in the brain where you literally feel loopy and you feel loopy for a couple of hours. And, you know, again, you know, some of the scientists that research this and study this, they talk about like the autophagic and the hormetic, the hormetic process, the, the, the chemical biochemical cascade that happens when that really gets really strong is that loopy feeling you're feeling. But like for me, when I fast for like 40 to 44 hours, which I'll do every, usually like once a month, I'll do a weekend, right? I I, I feel that. Like I, I, I'm i like, I stand up all of a sudden and I'm kind of loozy and mm. lightheaded and kind of like, oh my God, what's going on? 
and I don't lose, it's not a blood sugar issue. You know, I once thought that that's what it was, but it's that, it's the changeover or it's the crossover. So now like your body is like not running on food anymore. It's like running on spirit or, you know, call it energy, call it, you know, uh, catecholamines, whatever it is. Like it's some sort of a cascade, but like the, the, the nootropic yeah. peptides do do that. Yeah. So Tessofensi that's a, yeah, is fasting's a natural way to really make. Right. So combined those. fasting with that. Interesting. Mm. And it's like, whoa, accelerate. Now, That'd dihexa was, mm -hmm. is, is research is being researched for what dementia yep. alzheimer's yep. just just degenerative disorders of the brain so all of the in the studies and, and again we're going to russia again so the russians especially uh, dr cavinson they got a lot of research on cerebralisin dihexa selenc cmax cmax amidate so by the way uh when you add like amidate or uh, you know, a couple of the dates and whatever to them, you're extending the efficacy and you're extending uh, the solubility. Oh, okay. So it will last longer from a half-life standpoint in the Got brain it. and the body. So that's like why a lot of the research chemical companies are doing that. You'll see that a lot with them now. And then of course, they're also getting around the patents and mm -hmm. stuff like that. There really isn't a lot of patents in peptides. Thank God. That's why all of us are able to use them still. Um, but, you know, as we were saying on the first episode, you could see that coming, but um, what do you find with the people you work with, with, with dihexa, you, the people that, that are, I don't know, non-responders, they just don't notice it. And the people that do, what do they notice? Is it same as I you said? guys, okay. same as you guys, just, you know, more productive, yeah. um, more creative, like <clears throat> juice, you know, just feel like you can get into a flow state a little bit better. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Now I've read the, uh, like dosing protocols that, that vary wildly. Yeah. Like some yeah. would say, you know, 25 or 30 milligrams once a week. Yeah. And then others like, no, every day. And yeah. then I've heard people like you say, oh, I've tried, you know, much higher doses. Well, so, I mean, like it's a, it's a good, it's a good comment. I mean, I, I've seen people like women say they get as great effect at five milligrams, you know, of dihexa oral. And I'm like, what? Wow. So again, it's across the board, you know, biochemical individuality, I, I would okay. assume, you know, yeah. and some people just having different genes and receptor sensitivities and whatnot. It's weird. Uh, Selenc. Beso you know, in, if we if we compare and contrast dihexa and selenc, I see more people in my experience, personal experience, and obviously clients, people I communicate with online, and then of course clinicians. I see more people get better results with selenc than I get with when I see with dihexa. Okay, now selenc is uh, used in. Correct me if I'm wrong. They use that also as an anxiolytic. Yes. Okay. So anti anxiety. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I noticed a little bit of that from the CMAX and the Hexa as well. Yeah. Um, do they do these nootropics in general? So here's what's interesting to me. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, typically what people would consider, although you, you can't put caffeine in the category of nootropics, but if you tell someone things that make you feel sharp or whatever, they'll think, oh, caffeine. Right. Typically stimulants are, do the opposite of what an anxiolytic will do. They'll make right. you feel more anxious or yes. jittery or shaky. Yes. What I, when I keep reading about these peptide nootropics, many of them boost cognitive function, yep. but also work as an anxiolytic, which is, which is very interesting. So it's kind of like a calm focus. It's a different feeling than like a stimulant type of Well, effect. it's because they're not hitting the beta andro andronergic heart system, right? So oh, okay. not, there's no heart rate elevation or any kind of, um, what do you call it's it? All uh, the, it's all in the head. Yeah, it's not, there's no vasculature. It, you know, so essentially, you know, with the, with the caffeine or any kind of like speedy, you know, again, uh, amp, uh, alert focus agent, whatever it's hitting the beta energetic okay. pathway. So it's, it's, it's constricting or opening blood flow. Okay. Now modafinil is a bit of a stimulant, right? It is, but that's also one of those weird, uh, you know, again, call it a focusing agent where they don't really understand the mechanism of action. You okay. know, again, it's kind of an alien drug. They started giving it to, uh, pilots, pilots I think in the early seventies, uh -huh. yeah, to fly sorties in Vietnam. Yeah. And, and, now yeah, the one, the, the one you were raving about on the last podcast towards the end was tesofensin. Tesofensin. Okay. So what, so what, is, what, how is that one different from what we just so talked about? So te again, tesofensin was originally an orphaned uh, drug that was started off as an antidepressant. However, it's not an SSRI, right? So people hear antidepressant and they're like, oh bro, you're talking about SSRI. It was not an SSRI, but it was orphaned because for whatever reason, and again, it's in my book, but and, and I'm not thinking probably as clearly as I should on why it was orphaned, but it, for whatever it was orphaned, you know, big pharma orphans drugs when it's not exactly what they created it for. Right. And then it's let go. And then, you know, as you guys know, it just people remains discover, in the book somewhere. Yeah. And yeah. then somebody discovers it for something else and they're like, like wow. And so, <laughs> exactly. But tesofencine, they were looking at the weight loss that people were experiencing. Okay. On it. Hmm. 
And then they're like, wait a minute. You know, so whenever there's an opportunity, because so many fat people like to, you know, explore it. And so then they started looking at the trials. And as I was telling you guys, not only does it increase BDNF and do you feel really like fired up and amazingly energized. And again, I'm on it right now. And by the way, I only took 250 milligrams of it this morning and I've been taking 500 and I, you know, get what I thought was like even a better effect. But today was just 250. I feel it's crazy. I feel the same. And I've had people tell me they're like, oh, you know what? If you're really sensitive to it, you're not going to notice a difference. But uh, but from the people that are um, like sensitive to it, where 500 keeps them up at night and they're staring at the ceiling with a smile on their face because no one will complain about it other than that they can't sleep on it. Mm -hmm. Right. But there, I mean, even the people that would complain and say, dude, I can't take this. I can't sleep on it. They were like, I love this though. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. I cannot stop. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> I can keep creating, I keep creating. And again, it's because of the BDNF, but when they were looking at the research and the people that were on it for a long time before they orphaned the drug, they noticed the weight loss. Jay, I, I, let me comment on that real sure. quick. Cause I, so I was having a conversation with, um, our friends, uh, we work with a hormone therapy lab that does peptides as yep. well. And I noticed uh, on dihex, I'm very sensitive to compounds, or I, I notice things when I when I take them. Typically, these guys may say I'm a hypochondriac. I think I'm just sensitive. No, you're sen you're intuitive, right? So when I take when I take things, I can tell certain things. And I said, I I, I messaged him. I said, does do these nootropics make you leaner? And he goes, I don't. I mean, I mean, some people will say that. So and and so I said, this is very interesting. So I was starting to do some reading, and uh, I came across articles on chess players, and in intense games of chess, chess players will burn calories right. like they're doing a shit ton of right. cardio. I mean, right. they're literally sitting there right. playing chess, right? but their brain is working so hard and the brain is, it can, can burn a tremendous Absolutely. amount of energy. Yeah. So my speculation, and I'd love your input on this was that some of these nootropics through the BDNF, through increasing activity in the brain, actually boost metabolism through the brain, not through the, what we typically think of, which would be muscle or the rest of the body, but rather through brain activity. How do you, how do you, how does that, Sound so you. it's 100% true, okay. and I'll go a little bit woo on why that is the truth. Okay. So at base essence, all we are is energy and frequency, right? Oh. As I was telling you guys, we are literally light. We are biophotonic charges. I mean, that's just true at the, at the base level. Exactly. Yeah. So, but if we are at base essence, energy and frequency, and all we are is really consciousness, which is mind, right? I mean, if you really want to go deeper, you would be like, we're, we're the, the only thing we really are is like the idea of the divine mind separated by will and intention. But when your brain is stimulated like that and you are thinking very deeply and creatively and creating through expression, then yes, energetically, you are also accelerating your metabolism. Okay. Okay. So that's yeah, and again, the studies on chess players is pretty wild. You can For see sure. they're burning thousands of calories For sure. sitting down. Yeah, exactly. Because they're thinking really hard. Well, I mean, and then, you know, you can also look at the people that are riding a cart, you know, Formula One. Look at yeah. how, those guys. There's no fat guys there. I mean, they're, no. and what are, they're not, they're not exercising. But at least they're somewhat, I mean, they're, they're well, yeah, but I mean, they're yeah, in intense heat. Yeah, but the amount heat. that they burn is insane. Yeah, no, but they're in intense heat, but their brain is yes. so focused yes. on the road and the competition and everything. So, oh, those guys are massive tesofensine junkies and stimulant really? junkies and Adderall junkies. And uh, oh, I was just going to ask you, so of all, because you work with a lot of people, yeah. um, it, who are who are the types of people that are most interested in these nootropic categories of peptides? Who, who do you where do you find the, the, it's the, it's interesting? I I, I don't really I, I don't really have an answer on that. I mean, I definitely know that professional athletes are interested mm. for sure because again, the grind, the travel, you know, being in a new city, having mm. to have different time zones and all that stuff, they want to be at their best. Um, but it's a good question. I mean, I I think it applies to a lot of different people. Again, depending on your work. Uh, depending on your life, depending on what you do. Um, Are you finding these things blowing up? So Silicon Valley, obviously we're right now, we're in, we're in Silicon Valley in San Jose. And this was the place that popularized microdosing, yeah. you know, yeah. psilocybin yeah. and LSD right. to improve right. productivity because yep. they're coding and all that stuff. Are you finding these types of peptides blowing up in particular in, in areas like this? Kind of, kind of okay. not. I mean, I mean, you know, the, those guys are more into plant medicine okay, and the whole like, you know, DMT spirit, you know, all that kind of stuff, the, okay. the toad. I mean, they're not, it's not that they're not into this. They're always looking for edge. I mean, the easiest way to quantify it is like, who's looking for an edge, right? right? right. The people that are looking for an edge, regardless of what industry or niche or vertical are, are looking at these things. Um, but it's interesting you say that to get back to tesofensine. So when they looked at the research, they saw massive weight loss. Yeah. And they're like, what the hell is going on? So then they start looking at it. And again, as I was telling you guys, and this is the real magic of it, at four months plus usage of it. So again, every day, either, you know, 
the, again, the clinical studies are showing 0.5, but now there's 0.25, you know, some of the research chemical companies have half the dose. Um, metabolic uncoupling starts happening, right? So metabolic uncoupling is happening from increase in brown adipose tissue, right? Or white tissue, which is again, you know, brown fat, which is obviously increasing, uh, you the know, resting. Yeah, exactly. And now, it, 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 am I saying this right, Jay? Resting because, energy. Experience. Well, yeah, because when, when we talk about the metabolism and we explain to people boosting your metabolism, a lot of people think it's just direct lean body mass, more metabol more higher metabolism or less lean body mass, lower metabolism. But there's this like range of more versus less efficient uh, calorie burning with your body with the same lean body mass and less efficient means you just burn more energy and you burn right, it off. Right. That's this metabolic uncoupling that you're talking about. hundred percent. So okay. it's like, if you look at like, there's three ways to lose body fat, right? Like there's energy, right? Mm. Uh, I'm sorry. There's movement patterning, which would be lifting weights or doing cardiovascular exercise. Yeah, just moving. And then, and then there's the more muscle you have, the more metabolically active you are, the more thermo uncoupling there is. And now there's the third path, which is what we're talking about, where agents that actually stimulate metabolic uncoupling, mm -hmm. right? And they can do that through, again, increasing white brown, uh, or brown, uh, brown adipose tissue, white, white fat, which again is the highest uh, energy expenditure fat in the body, which, you know, again, again, is increasing metabolic uncoupling from just taking the supplement. So those are like the three ways. And that's why I was telling you guys that now we're in a place where we weren't four years ago, where you can take these agents, you can build muscle, do your cardio, um, and also, again, through uh, your genetics or through how much muscle you have on your body, burn fat in three different ways. Wow, interesting. Well, so how, people, does, how does that measure up with, you know, the last time we talked, um, I asked about the peptide in relation to uh, the infrared. Yeah. And we talked a bit about that, uh, pairing those together. You you bring up white and brown fat, right away my brain goes to the cold, cold plunge. plunge. Absolutely. Yeah. All those things now will play a role. So that's what I'm saying. Like even in that, and I'm not even, so my, in my 30 days, we talk about doing red light and we talk about doing um, cold showers and stuff like that, you know, which is obviously uh, uh, thermogenesis through shivering, right? Through mm -hmm. cold, increasing it that way. But yeah, you could throw those in too. So, I mean, you all, if you combine all of those things, there's never, ever, at least in, again, in this current era, been a time where people can lose body fat so efficiently and preserve muscle mass. Right? Because you guys, we're all bros, right? At, at Base Essence, we're all bros here. And we all, we all understand that, if you're going to lose body fat, you have to preserve muscle at all costs. Yeah, so, right, right. You know, and a lot of people lose sight of that. So it's like, uh, you know, in the audience, there's people out there like, oh, I want to lose fat, I want to lose fat, you know. And, and, and you know, here's the other thing, because somebody said this to me the other day, and I was like, wow, because I never looked at it from this perspective. But if you were a fat person, like a very morbidly obese person, you wouldn't give a flying you-know-what if you lost muscle, because in your mind, you just want to be skinny. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we know that that's wrong, though, because they just don't understand that. Because obviously, if you lose muscle, you degrade thyroid hormone, you uh, you know cause all sorts of issues with your BMR, Slow resting down metabolism. metabolism. Yeah, all that stuff is 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 degraded or or uh, you know made made worse over time. And then which, you can't and, maintain the weight loss. Exactly, yeah. and then you have you know caloric uh, you know explosion after, and yeah, exactly, everything goes bad. You have metabolic haywire mode. People do not realize uh, how easily you could actually lose 30 pounds on the scale and actually get fatter yes. from a body fat percentage. That blows people's mind when I try and explain that's that. A, that's exactly right. And and I'm glad you just said that because I want to I want to quantify that even more. So as I was telling you guys, and I'm not trying to plug my book, I'm just, I, I want to explain it in a perfect way. Uh, if you want to plug my book, you can. Yeah, no, we will. <laughs> but, but, but the, so I have a book coming in April or May, you know, whenever this podcast runs, it doesn't matter in 2023. Uh, that's going to be called 30 Days to Shreds. And as I was telling you guys, it'll be like the greatest book, at least in my mind, ever written on showing exactly what you just talked about on how to lose pure fat in 30 days, right? Mm -hmm. So whether you're obese or you're average or you're like us and you're you know trying to get to the lowest body fat you've ever looked for whatever, a photo shoot, a, phys a fitness competition, whatever, you will be able to do this using these drugs, using these peptides, using these agents without losing any muscle, okay? So again, the most efficient way possible. And you're right getting back to what I was trying to say about the, you know, the obese person is they don't understand why they're doing it or why, what is the best way to do it. They just want to lose the weight. Right. So it's up to us and guys like us to teach people like now, how is the, how is, what is the best way to do this without compromising, obviously your health, uh, your safety. And at the same time, without losing a single ounce of muscle. And I'm say, here to say it now, it's possible. You guys all know Lyle McDonald, you know, me and him, mm. you know, I've been back and forth. And, you know, at one time I was actually friends of him, poor Lyle, shout outs to you. If you listen to this Lyle, 
uh, he's nuts. Unhinged is unhinged. Wow, you're unhinged. But like literally, uh, you know, he used to get into arguments and debates with people about like, it's not possible. If you're going to lose body fat, you're still going to lose muscle. And I'd always be like, you know what? Thermodynamically, you're probably right. You're going to lose some skeletal mass. You're going to lose some water, which as you guys know, is part muscle. That's lean mono mass. My debate or my argument or my whole you know thesis with this new book coming will be that not anymore. Now you can use terzapatide, right? And by the way, we didn't even talk about it on the first podcast, and we have to mention it right now. There is a one, there's one coming that is called a triple agonist. It's called Retra True Tide. It's been through phase two and phase three clinical trials. It's written about in the book. There's a whole special note in there, and that will be the peptide that literally hits all three energy pathways. So the ones that we just talked about. So you will be able to take this, and it will literally be the best. What is it agonizing? Most amazing. You got triples of beta. Yep. Beta agonite. What else? Uh, it's beta. Um, man, what are the other two? Um, well, what are the, so you've got, you've got beta anergic, you've got beta stimulatory, you have, what's the third one? Um, damn. Yeah. I don't know. I, was, I, I know, I know, I know, I know, but I'm just, I do, I should know this right off the top of my head, but it's, so essentially it's, it's hitting everything. It's again, it's going to increase resting energy expenditure. It's going to delay appetite or dull appetite, suppress appetite, and it's going to enhance BMR. Hmm. And it's a peptide and it'll be again, one shot a week. So imagine when this comes into the market, you know, cause we were talking about terzapatide and semaglutide and how it's revolutionized the game. Yeah. Once this one comes, it's going to be like, there won't be obese people if they can afford it, but yeah. that'll be the question. Yeah. Can now, they now, now, now I'm sure that you, with the appetite suppression at some point, you get to have, you have to eat at least enough to maintain because okay. your body will get rid of Let, Let's talk enough. about that okay. because Dr. Atia just did a big thing. That's about what I'm referring to. Yeah. And I love Peter. He was, and again, you know, Peter has this mysterious way to always extrapolate research in diseased people. Now, in the studies that he's looking at, he's looking at clinically obese people. Okay. Okay. So morbidly obese. And, and let's face it, when you're morbidly obese, you're comorbid, right? You usually have type 2 diabetes, you're metabolically dysregulated, or you have insulin, um, you know, resistance, or all of the above. Let's just, just call it you're metabolically deranged. Those people are losing muscle because it goes back to what you were saying. They don't care. They're not lifting weights. Most of them are not doing cardiovascular exercise. They're not eating enough protein. They're just literally just in their mind. And less. Exactly. Like, oh, I don't have to eat anymore. So I'm 400 pounds and now I'm 300 pounds. But yeah, you lost a lot of muscle because you're not doing anything to maintain muscle. You, yeah. There's still a minimum modicum of ever, effort and energy and exertion that you have to pour. So it's like, you know, Peter, you know, glossed on that. And I know Joe Rogan talked about it too or something. He said, oh, it was 35% muscle mass that they lost. Well, yeah, because they're not doing anything to preserve their muscle. Right. And right. they're not eating enough protein. So it's, it's important to, you know, uh, causation does not eat equal to correlation. Right. And you can't extrapolate again in studies in, in diseased people or sick people or fat people or whatever you want to call it, that this is what goes on in us. Because I'm here to tell you guys, I've been using, I used semaglutide for eight months. And it's okay. I started using terzapatide in August. And for my 24th birthday, 24th birthday, I wish I was 24. Yes. I look like I'm 24. <laughs> when I turned 52 on the 24th of February, which was last Friday, I was the most leanest I've ever been. Okay. Now I've been eating since then. So I don't look as good as I looked last Friday, but I mean, I did it in 30 days with all of those agents. And I, terzapatide, which we didn't really talk about that much is not a triple agonist. It's a double agonist because again, it's increasing metabolism uh, and dulling appetite. Yeah. What's interesting too is when you look at compounds that uh, that they've studied that actually do burn or um, amplify pure body fat loss. Yep. They also tend to preserve or build muscle at the right. same time. So, right. testosterone is one of those exactly. things. Um, growth hormone. Yep. One of those things. Yep. Myostatin inhibition. Yep. yep. When you inhibit myostatin, you see muscle gain and fat loss. So the muscle building fat loss, you know, combination is, I mean, it's not an uncommon thing. That's right. Now it's challenging when you work with the average person because you, they cut calories, they tend to exercise wrong, do a shit ton of cardio, no strength training. They're not eating the right way. And so they end up sending a really strong, you know, uh, metabolic adaptation signal right. to their body. Um, but if you do it the right way, I mean, we train people for a long time. Uh, especially beginners, I would often get people who build and lose at the same time. Now, That's after right. a while, it's more mostly just lose. But in the beginning, you know, and this is with using no peptides or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah. Well, no, it's 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 a great point. I, I actually when 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 um, Ava first reached out to me, 
and I was researching you guys. I mean, I knew who you guys were, but I was listening to you. I listened to one of your shows where you guys were doing a show um, on, or, or it was a clip, I think, on TikTok. It took me to TikTok, but I watched okay. the podcast where you were talking about higher reps and how oh, like- That's the one where people were trying to come after us. It's yeah. so funny. But you guys no are contact. 100% right. Yeah. I mean, I could do a whole show with you guys on that. Look, I want to I want to say this. You guys are, props to you guys. Um, and, and again, and I'm really good friends with Mark Ripito and I'm you know really good friends with the guys at Elite. And I love those guys, but they don't understand energy systems. And to build muscle, you have to tax all three energy systems over time. So when you're te- when you're te- when you're doing one rep maxes, threes, fives, sixes, even eights, you're not hitting the higher. You know that you're not hitting the aerobic the aerobic lactate. You're not hitting the phosphogenic. You're only hitting the type two. You know fibers, right? So it's like, if you're not, what you guys were saying is so many people miss this. You do have to train in all the various rep ranges over Mm -hmm. time to build muscle, especially as you get older and you become more adapted to building muscle. Yeah. I don't care what rep range you train and you stand that all the time. It's it's, it's exactly, exactly right. But so many guys, especially younger guys, and I'm not making fun of them, but you you know, you, you read these guys, you know, big name guys, a lot of followers, you know, in their thirties, they start talking about like, Oh, eight, reps is the perfect rep range to, to train at or six or whatever it is. And then they give you all the science. It's like, dude, I'm 52. I've been training for 30 years, building muscle. Like I know that if I train at eight rep range, I wouldn't build any muscle. No. I, I would probably start to atrophy as I got older, right? Cause my body requires different and significant more adaptation. And it's not about obviously uh, how much I lift or anything like that. It's, you know, it's more about the intensity and again, continuing to fatigue the fibers over time. Yeah. And I know that was kind of a rabbit hole, but it, it does, it does equal what we're talking about, which is energy. And you cannot, you know, over time, again, we're getting into fat loss. Like you cannot over time, not expect, like you were saying to not have muscle and fat, I'm sorry, muscle accrual or muscle retention not happen at the same time that you're doing fat loss if you do it right. If you do it right, mm-hmm. yeah. If you do it right, you do everything right, it feels effortless. So and w- it does. And, and what what when I when I know I've done it right with a client is that they they'll start eating a particular caloric maintenance. We put them on a cut or a reverse diet and put them sure. on a cut. They'll end up eating more at the end of the weight loss journey than they did in the beginning. Exactly. So their maintenance is higher and they're lighter. They're you, leaner. You increase their be- resting energy expenditure because now they're now more muscular right. and they have less body fat. Right. All right. Let's go back to nootropics because I, I, you know, I yep. th- that was the the target of the episode. What is your favorite stack for peptide nootropics, or do you like to stick to just one? What have you found the most success, not just with yourself, but with the people you've worked with? Yeah. So I mean, I mean, th- this is a really good question because I think it does come down to the end user. Like you know, my business partner Nick Andrews, which I'm sure we'll have on at some point. He loves C-Max, he loves Solank, and he also takes Cerebralyacin together. So okay. all three of those together. We haven't even talked about Cerebralyacin. We will. You have to be, you know, we have to speak in code about that. But uh, for me, like I, you know, like I told you guys, I don't get a tremendous result from any of them, but I kind of like uh, Solank Amidate, the intranasal. Like okay. that's the one that I feel like, whoa, like, you know, like I'm noticing this. Mm-hmm. Like, again, nothing like makes me rave, nothing like Tessa Fensi. Okay. Like if I'm if I'm just going to tell you guys like what is what I feel the best on is tesofensine. Okay. But again, it's not even considered a nootropic peptide, although it should be because again it, it heightens BDNF so much. Um, yeah, and again, just, because fat loss is more popular. So well, I mean, but also like uh, as I was telling you guys, like it doesn't cause receptor attenuation, so there's no downgrading. You can come come off of it cold turkey. Uh, and you know, you could take it for as long as you want with no side effects. Right. So it's pretty amazing. Am I going to notice if I go off Mm -hmm. Dihexa and C-Max right out the gates, do I need to slowly wean down? Uh, It's, there's no way to know until you do it. Okay. You know, I mean, I, I, I I haven't heard that like, you know, outstanding from anybody who say, Oh my God, you know, no, but I mean, it's possible that you could. Okay. I had a thought too, as we were kind of like exploring this, that, uh, so you brought up too, that you had been like sleep deprived on some level. I myself have, you know, and I'm pretty sure we've been fighting a little bit of like low levels of like apnea, uh, in terms of like us being able to feel the effects of it more and like sleep being a factor there. And like, how much is that is, like 
prerequisite oh, going in. Yeah, like you know. sleep like sleep deprived people are gonna probably see a bigger effect basically. Well that was my theory on yeah. you guys because I said I'm sleeping great right now and I'm also very high doses of caffeine. So I thought I yeah, wonder if I'm very if dependent I'm, on caffeine. Yeah, I wonder if with. I'm not feeling it very much because I'm I don't have any issues with sleep. Mm. I'm getting I'm drinking tons of my my, my higher doses of caffeine right now. So it's mi mitigating any potential positive benefits. You guys are the opposite right now. Yeah. yeah interesting. Yeah. I mean that's a, I don't know. those are great points. I mean like I would say to you like I would know myself, but it makes a lot of sense that if you're sleep deprived and then the peptide is giving you better energy and better focus, it's, it's more heightened. Yes. So it's a, it's the whole well, uh, lack of sleep crushes oh, BDNF. Absolutely. If you don't sleep, your BDNF is a hundred percent. No, a hundred percent. So that may be why, right? Yeah. I mean, w without, without a doubt, I mean, we all definitely, so here's the thing and I don't want to rabbit hole, but sleep, you know, I studied a lot about melatonin and the melatonin pathways in the brain and stuff like that. People say you need eight hours, you know, six to eight hours of sleep a night. That's actually not true. What you do need is four hours of polyphasic sleep, which is the deep restorative sleep, which very few people get today because right. of phones and, you know, EMF radiation and, you know, idiots like charging their phone next to their bed and, you know, all this stuff that like keeps us awake where we don't actually fall into that deep restorative sleep. Uh, I don't know about you guys, um, and this isn't a plug for them, but like to me, the greatest biohack ever is the eight sleep mattress, right? Like I sleep on the eight sleep mattress. What is that? That's it's just uh, like our, we have, we are, we you guys have the Uber. chill pads. Yeah. Oh Ooh. dude, those, oh, guys, yeah. those okay. things. That, are, we yeah. talk about no, those that changed, that those changed things, my life. Those but are dude, huge. If you think those are good, you guys got to get the eight sleep mattress. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, the eight sleep We're not sponsored by them. <laughs> Shiites all over. <laughs> really that good. <laughs> oh my God. Yes. I mean, that's like, I mean, my wife, so my wife is, is, uh, you know, going through perimenopause. She's just turned 51. And like women, when they're going through that are new, nuclear reactors. I mean, yeah. like they're going oh, hot yeah. to cold. And like with that, like it's the most unbelievable thing. I yeah. sleep like a bear. I sleep at 55 yeah. degrees. That's I, I have mine mm -hmm. the best cold as it will Same. go. Yeah. Like, and we'll, so, well, I, we don't have to, you know, compare and contrast. Those are great. But like, this is like a whole different level. I don't like, I don't wear my aura ring anyway anymore because it tracks everything. Yeah. It's unreal. I mean, oh, so the sleep aid actually that tracks that too. Everything. Okay. Oh, that's oh, interesting. Oh, it's the most amazing thing you can. Oh, so ever. that's what you like more about it then? Because I say if they're both cooling the mattresses and oh, doing no. all that, so, I mean, it's like, the tracking it, yeah, and stuff. Yeah, it's that, everything else that comes uh, with it. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's so <laughs> unbelievable. It's the most amazing tech. But but to back to back to that, like I I would definitely say that. All you, all the listening audience, all of you guys, it's critically important that you sleep at least four hours consecutively. Yeah. And that's hard for guys that have like older guys that have prostate issues. And a lot yeah, of get us, up and pee. Well, yeah, well, a lot of us, because we're on therapeutic testosterone, you know, we do other things. I don't know if you knew, know this, and I didn't know this when I first started doing this. And actually, it's funny we're talking about Dan Shane because he's the guy that taught me this. So ripped fuel back in the day. Yeah. So ripped <laughs> fuel had this mysterious. Bro, I, I must. I've, I've given you got me tens yeah. of thousands of dollars fuel. in the past. So ripped fuel had this mysterious way to dilate the smooth muscle in the walls of the prostate. Yeah. So if you started using, is it because fuel, it's a bronchodilator? Is it, yes. is it similar? Okay. Yeah. So in your twenties, oh, if you shit. started having a narrower piss stream, or it wouldn't drip all the way out, or you just didn't have that flow that you had, that was because the ripped fuel was dilating the smooth muscle along the walls of the ureter and the whole tract, the whole area in there. Yeah, minute, so I remember, yes, yeah, so check this out. So I remember and when I first started using it, I was like, what's going on? I went to see a urologist. And then he recommended me to an endocrinologist. And then I went back to another urologist before I ever started therapeutic testosterone. And none of them had any clue. They were just like, oh, you know, you're just going to have to just like, you know, put your hand like right there. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. It was like, Zoom I should have known that, at that please. point that like clinic <laughs> clinicians are mostly brain dead. They're just told what to say by, you know, pharmaceutical reps. But uh, once I met Dan and I started telling him about that, he's like, oh, blah, 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 and he just told me exactly. And I was like, Jesus. So, so the, so the, the ephedra and the rip fuel, it, it can vasoconstrictor or vasodilator? Both. So it's, okay. it's constricting the urethra and dilating like in other areas. That's why like so you'd have that. Yeah. Oh, and right. then that's why also you'd have like, if you remember, I if did you had to say like a bigger yes. hose that's kinked off. Is yes. That going on? Exactly. <laughs> Where sometimes you have this like crazy flow and you're like, and then all of a sudden it stops and you're just like, what is going yeah. on? Oh, okay. God. So, so, wow. <laughs> so Bro, I used to buy rip fuel and speed stack by the, by Bro, the GX exactly. we, so we managed, I had a refrigerator dedicated up. to just that in my twenties. Oh, we managed big box gyms, and so so because of Dan Duquesne, he and, and his books and just He's reading. Such a genius. So I used to read Muscle Media two thousand and all that stuff, right? I combined 
ephedra, caffeine, aspirin, yohimbi. All of that. Yeah, white and, willow bark. Uh, white will- <laughs> and I did all that shit, and I swear to God, I worked out for three hours, came home, thought I was going to die because I obviously took too high of a dose. So, Dan, you almost killed me. But Dan, but isn't that hilarious, though? But because of Dan, like, now you know that. I mean, and, not, and no, none of the doctors even knew that. But that's yeah. what that was doing. And so now I'm 52, and you guys aren't getting any younger either. And we all have BPH as we get older. It's a part of being a man. Wow. Right. So it's like to understand that. And that's why I was telling you guys, I'm like, we'll talk after the show, but like, that's why we want to get on the prostate bioregulators because they're going to stop the BPH as we get older Wow, and be on therapeutic testosterone. All right. Yeah. All right. Just to close the loop on, yeah. on nootropics, yeah. increasing BDNF. What does that feel like? And I can tell you what I feel like. And, uh, but I'd love to hear what you, yeah. what, because you've worked with so many people. For sure. So for me personally, what it feels like is. I feel uh, if you've ever been through those times when you feel inspired, yes, I feel exactly like that more is. often. Uh, I feel like memory recall is sharper. In yep. fact, one thing that I noticed when I first started going on these was I was remembering things yes. that I had forgotten. So like childhood things <laughs> yeah. or commercials right. Right. or articles that I had read a long time ago, all of a sudden were kind of popping up. Well, creative flow is much better. That's yeah, exactly. And, it, and verbal fluency. So, so is this, uh, this is what I'm, I'm assuming higher BDNF uh, feels like. Is this what you're getting from other people as it's well? It's 100%. And, okay. and just so you know, the, the, when you have higher levels of BDNF, you're, you're, able to reach into the hippocampus, which is the storage. That's the storage of the memory. Okay. And that's why you're remembering all those things. But that's exactly right, Justin. I also feel like I'm in a better mood. Creative flow, 100%. Okay. So that's the inspiration. So the better mood is like, it's not really dopaminergic signaling pathways, although that's what it's, that's what it kind of feels like. But the BDNF just, what it really does, you just said it, you nailed it. It increases creative expression. So when you're creative, you don't, you're not living in like the, you know, how we all hear a million times that the only thing that matters is right now, right? Mm-hmm. The now moment, the yeah. zero point when you're creative, you're in the zero point. Yeah. Now, are they all doing which that or is it, which, which one does that the best? Like which I, they all from, from my, and I'd love, of course, yeah. you know, and from what I've read, they all affect BDNF. Yes. They all raise BDNF. Okay. Every Just nootropic different is ways. doing it. Yes. Okay. Every okay. nootropic is enhancing BDNF. You said it too already. So like, Fasting is huge for BDNF. So that's, and again, going back to this book, is like, you know, I'm going to have a whole chapter on like, if the key is enhancing creative flow or creative expression, then what do we do in combination to enhance that so that we can live in that state, the zero point at all times in our life? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Fasting, BDNF enhancing agents, uh, red light, cold plunging, exercise, sleep, exercise, yeah. deep restorative sleep. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's no oh. question that we can use all these new, these new tools and, and tactics to live in the now point. Now, Jay, not to go on a left, but you talked about, uh, I, I, now that I have you, I want to ask you this question. Um, we talked, you talked about deep sleep or restorative sleep. Yeah. I also started playing with a peptide uh, called DSIP, DSIP, deep sleep, yeah. uh, deep, deep sleep inducing peptide. Yes. That is, is supposed to raise the, the 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 amount of REM. What is it? Three or four? Yep. Stage sleep. So okay, yep. okay. That yeah. one's pretty wild too. It's amazing. Uh, I've only used it once in my life, and uh, I didn't take enough of it. Uh, but it is a, a definitely an amazing peptide. Definitely one to also talk about. Like if we come back, uh, if when when I come back, and if Nick comes back with me, and we talk about bioregulators, we'll go into that stuff too. But we okay. should definitely talk about organ systems and how, like, as we get older, like, like. So I would actually say to like maybe loop this all together and end it like what the next frontier in our space is how do we enhance what we're already enhancing right so we're enhancing through testosterone we're enhancing through growth hormone we're enhancing through bdnf agents and focusing agents and nootropics and all this stuff but we're also aging so what is the backdrop to keep improving and not stagnating as we enhance till the end right and maybe the end is actually not the end maybe the end is now we live to 200 Mm. You know what I mean? Like we're now enhancing our DNA through thymolin, uh, you know, pineolon. We didn't talk about that. We'll talk about that on bioregulators. I mean, so pineolon, just a rabbit hole for one second, is literally increasing the pineal gland. 
Well, wow. which, so which, which is mostly which is mostly calcified from living in the United States or any of the Western world. <laughs> no. Yeah, I mean, yeah, for sure it is. I mean, that's not a conspiracy anymore. You know, it's hilarious. Is like dentists still tell you that fluoride is okay. Like, have you guys ever gotten into a debate about a dentist about like, hey, I don't want my kid to have yeah. fluoride stuff, and they look at you like, what are you talking so about? So it's not a conspiracy theory anymore <laughs> that, it, that, it, that it calcifies the the pineal gland. It's definitely not a conspiracy theory. I remember that you know, ten years ago. Yeah, that no, was like, was, oh, no, 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 no. There's tons of research. Out there, 4G. it's just covered up. They just don't want to tell you that. Yeah. And dentists don't learn that in dental school. I actually did a funny thing two years ago with my kids. I I, I was interviewing dentists in Temecula, um, just to ask them about that, and not a single one of them yeah, until no. I finally got to one, and he was like, "My God, you never want to have." There's actually a dentist who's a good friend of mine. He's in Germany right now. Uh, I forget his name, Doctor Whatever. He's pretty big. He's a pretty big influencer right now. But he's the guy that takes out all of the. Um, what do you call it? Uh, mercury fillings? Mercury. Yes. Oh, yeah. And he's also like one of the world's leading experts on talking about um, fluoride and decalcifying the pineal gland wow. and stuff like that. So it's all out there now. It's just, you know, again, they just lie to us. Wow. Wow. <laughs> well, and, Jay, and, and first, they're going to make you eat bugs yeah. after that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Can't wait. You'll own nothing. Own nothing. Be, be happy. Yeah. Hey, well, before, exactly. before we hang out, what I do want to tell our audience uh, that is hung in all the way to this, this point, you're probably people that will be very interested to hear this, is that, you know, my goal is to get Jay to come into the private forum that we have at MP Hormones. It's on Facebook. It's absolutely free. It's a great resource and hopefully get him to come in there and visit. Um, if I can monthly, if not quarterly, come in there and monthly for sure. Okay, monthly. cool. And just fire just hose of information. I'm committed yeah. monthly for Excellent. sure. That's I love amazing. That. I love that. Thanks, Jay. So appreciate Thank you that, guys. Jay. Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of you know, weak points and, and areas that I struggled with developing for a, a really long time, chest was up there with the- Yeah, it was for me. It was for me for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique. 